welcome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Hi, Jessica. How are Hello. You? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited. Awesome. So, um, first things first, um, what brought you to the interesting city of Manila? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, uh, Indonera actually has an office out here. We have about 30 people. Uh, we're based in Makati. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and we actually opened the office a year ago this week here. Wow, so that's like a big milestone for you, one having year. the one-year presence here already. Yeah, because at first, just like starting the startup, I was wondering, are we going to be able to grow a presence out here in a short amount of time? And we weren't really sure, but now to reflect on it, and I think, wow, that was only one year ago. That's pretty amazing. Um, so I'm curious, like, um, out of all the other countries that you could consider to, to put the shop, um, what made you choose Manila? Manila was really a no-brainer, actually. Like, I visited India, I visited Vietnam, Singapore, mm -hmm. um, I've been to Hong Kong, I've been to you know, Japan. So I've been to a lot of places. And with Manila, I think the most important thing is we you know a lot of people who uh, you know, grew, up, grew up here and uh, are Filipino, like Jose over here, he runs our office out here and uh, he grew up here, his family's here, so it makes it a lot easier to have a presence out here. And everyone in the Philippines is pretty smart, we speak English, the time zone difference isn't that bad with Cal uh, compared to California, uh, whereas India it's ridiculously bad. So between all those reasons we thought Manila would be great. Wow, that's, that's awesome to hear. Um, probably, I'd like to ask also because um, we've been doing a lot, uh, a bit of um, background, uh, looking at um, what you've done. So we learned that you set up your first startup when you were 13 years old, uh, which is really interesting. So um, I'm curious, what uh, got you interested into the startup world and putting up the startup? Sure. Well, I started my first business when I was 13, or 12 actually, but it wasn't that great of a business. It was just uh, just me and four friends, and we were trying to help small businesses out uh, with all their managed hosting services back before it was a big popular thing. And a company would pay us 300 or 400 or 500 or even in one case $1,000 every month to take care of that for them. And uh, for a 13-year-old or for a 12-year-old when I started it, that's actually a lot of money. Uh, if you think about it, if you add it up across several hundred customers. And that business didn't really go anywhere because I kind of ran it to the ground. I spent way too much money and ironically, we had some serious cash flow problems. And that's what inspired me to there. I didn't do my accounting well and I didn't, I didn't forecast out my money well and I thought, it's really important for an entrepreneur to know how they're spending their money. Yes, I knew how to do the technology, and yes, I knew how to inspire a few of my collaborators, but I didn't know how to deal with the money. That just wasn't my expertise. So what if, within the narrow, we could solve that problem for other entrepreneurs who are in a very similar position? That's what we do. That's why, that's why I go to work every day. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew that it was with your Indonero um, startup that it was incubated with Y Combinator, right? Um, how did that um, help you um, get um, your startup to where it is now? Y Combinator for us was really important. Out here you had Kickstart, you had Ideaspace, and maybe you had even more. But out in Silicon Valley, you only have Y Combinator, you have 500 startups, and maybe a handful of others. And I didn't really know anyone at the time. I didn't have any business contacts in the technology world. I only had business contacts in the clothing manufacturing world because that's what my mom does for a living. But that's really different. <coughs> and like all the family and friends I had growing up in New York City, they knew about banking and consulting and, and all that. But they didn't know about how to build a software company. So I had to build up a complete fresh set of connections. And Y Combinator helped us with all of that. So it's really important. I'm happy I went through it, uh, but now I have all the contacts I need in Silicon Valley. It's interesting that you mentioned how um, 
you're familiar with um, development, not really more on finance at that point. Um, at the core of it, though, I'm curious, do you, really, do you fundamentally consider yourself more a hacker at this point, or a hustler, or, um, or maybe like how how do you find how have you found um, being um, learning to wear different hats as with, with startups and having your own startup? At first, I was definitely more of a hacker. Mm -hmm. I started this company with a friend of mine in college, his name's Andy, and both of us were going through the computer science program, and we were pretty bored with our class. We would finish all of our homework really early on a Friday night, <coughs> order in some pizza, and just program for fun. Mm -hmm. I remember dad was like, really, he's really good at what he does, but back then, he didn't know anything about programming. So I was showing him like how to build an app in PHP back then, because Ruby on Rails was just starting to come up. And, um, and that's how we became friends. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked to say, yeah, I'm the business hustler. I like know how to do all that. But I really didn't know how to do any of that. I, didn't, I still didn't know accounting at the time. And I didn't know how to hire people. I didn't know how to like, raise capital. I didn't know how to do sales or marketing. All that kind of had to come along through the process. Um, so. Um, speaking of the process, um, I'm curious, with you building your startup from the ground up, um, what is your philosophy in terms of um, iterating, do you subscribe to rapid prototyping, or any other philosophy in that side? There are so many different philosophies you could have when you're building your business. And at first off, I was thinking, oh man, I'm going to follow like, Agile and Scrum, and I'm going to like do all this stuff. and like. Uh, and then we have all these uh, people online saying, oh, you should raise a lot of money or you should bootstrap and just so many different ideas on how to run a business, especially a software business. Lots of opinionated people out there. <laughs> and over time, I've started to think about just having my own opinion because it could go either way. Right. And I just remember like doing pitches and getting feedback and, and just feeling like, uh, I wasn't getting great advice. A lot of people I thought weren't giving me the right advice for me. And so now I try not to give people advice because I think they have to make it up on their own. They need to decide what they're going to do and what works for them. Because for some people, like, yeah, raise a lot of money and don't have any revenue. Just get users and hope that you'll make money one day. But that's not the philosophy I subscribe to. And that's fine. Everyone's got to have their own path. So help them find their path. Right. Um, so you were saying something about um, you know, getting users and getting traction. Um, can you maybe share more about um, your process of actually first getting uh, your first customer and making it viral from there on out? Getting the first customer was really, really hard okay. because we didn't really have a product. We didn't know what we were supposed to sell. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation that listed out what an arrow is. We'll do your accounting, we'll do your taxes, and here are the price points. But in truth, we didn't actually have any customers yet. So all of it was made up. And I took out a friend, I took a friend out to pizza, and I said, hey, like, let me help you out with your accounting stuff. And I gave her the full pitch. And I thought, worst case, she'll say this is horrible, and I'll confess to her. I'll say, yeah, I know. Actually, we don't have any customers, but I wanted to see if you liked it. <laughs> but she signed up. She said, this sounds great. Sign me up. And I thought, oh my god, like, we don't have any customers yet, and we can't even service your account. But I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and I came prepared. I was like, just in case she says yes, I printed out a credit card authorization. Form and a contract, mm -hmm. and I had it in paper format, and I slid it across the table to her, and she wrote down her credit card number, and she signed the contract, and, and then I brought it home, and Andy was, my co-founder Andy, he was playing StarCraft at the time. We had no customers, so there's nothing else to do. And I said, Andy, it's time to get to work. We have our first customer. And it's been crazy ever since. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, I'm curious also, like, did you already have a concrete idea of your business model from the start? 
um, or did it pivot along the way? And like, what were the factors that you considered were like, vital for you to have done those changes? Yeah, it's been a really rough ride actually, because we tried to start the company uh, back in the summer of 2010, and we raised about a little over a million dollars, and we got all this press, and the business wasn't going anywhere because we had like 40,000 users on the service. 40,000 people use business owners using in the net. But back then, the service was only $20 a month. And it was premium, so only 2 or 3% would upgrade. If you do the math on that, it's not a lot of money. You're making less than $100,000 a year. And I was burning a million dollars a year. And, it, and from my perspective, we have all this press, everyone thinks we're doing well, and we're about to go bankrupt. So I had to tell the people in the company that the company wasn't going anywhere, like it was a fun experiment, we all knew we weren't making any money, so it's time to get a new job. And then we got rid of the office, and then we moved back into my living room, and that's where Jose came to work for the first time, actually. <laughs> and and uh, we, we didn't know what to do for maybe six months. For six months, we were kind of stranded. We were thinking, all right, let's, we got to come up with a new business idea. we got to find a way to actually make money now, because we had less than $100,000 left in the bank. And we were getting pretty desperate. And... And so we started like trying to pick up hobbies again. So we, you know, went to Disney World. We like played golf, and we like did all these fun things. Finally, we're like, all right, now we gotta like get our life back together. And I remember Forbes gave us a call. They're like, we're gonna feature you on the Forbes 30 Under 30, and we're looking at each other, thinking like, what? Like we have nothing anymore, but they don't know. <laughs> and then Inc. called us like the next month, and they're like, we're gonna feature you too. We're like, wow. All right, sure. So I felt like. We felt like we were uh, like uh, con artists in a way, because <laughs> it looks good in the magazine, and like my mom got a copy, and she's like, "Wow, this is so awesome!" But I know you guys are doing terribly, so this is <laughs> really embarrassing, actually. <laughs> and now I have some friends who are like, "Yeah, like, like you must have 20 copies of it," but I never even got a copy of it because I was just too ashamed to even want to look at it. Even to this day, I haven't seen that in the actual magazine. Just, just, like I, I look at that and I think, wow, I was impersonating success back then. <laughs> and then that's when you know, we came up with, with the new idea for Nanero. So instead of just selling software, we're going to be full service. And over time, instead of just being an accounting firm, we're going to automate as much of this as possible through software. But at least we have a higher price point. Now we're charging, instead of $20 a month, we're charging hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars a month. Now we could build a real business. And that was the biggest change we made during that, that process. It's very humbling to go through that. So I'm curious, now that you have an arrow all rolling its um, uh, glory, do you still have lives? Uh, in terms of, do you still manage to find time for your hobbies? Yeah, I have a lot of time for fun. I mean, this is fun right now, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I try to take some time to just read and enjoy the outdoors. And, and I spend a lot of time seeing my family. Because all of us work so hard. All of us have our startups and our business. But like, you just can't forget about the other things that are important to us. So I try to make time for that, too. Cool. So, um, I'd also like to share with everyone that um, actually Jessica got her one million dollar funding when she was around twenty. You were twenty year old then, right? And and that was in two thousand ten. So yeah, she's amazing like that. Um, and yeah, apart from the fact that yeah, she started her first startup when she was thirteen. Um, she's a woman. Um, I was telling her earlier that. Um, probably here in the Philippines, it's more, it's more pronounced, all these distinct um, things that make up what, how unconventional she is as a startup founder. All things considering that startup founders are unconventional themselves. No. Um, 
So probably like a question that I'd like to ask you is, um, given that, um, what motivates you, what drives you, what drove you, and what continues to drive you? At first, what drove me, the sounds me a little uh, embarrassing too, but at first I thought, how great would it be to like, you know, be on all these lists and be like, you know, the New York Times and like, get all this press. Oh, That's wow. what I thought was really cool at first. And then you get all that and then you're failing and then you think, all right, like, I actually want to be successful. I don't just want to look successful. Uh, and then, but now, now that like things are okay, I'm motivated by trying to grow the business and trying to like, expand your staff and like, make sure they're having a great time working at the company. I think that's a lot more fun and rewarding than just coming in and trying to just make more money or increase market cap or all those arbitrary things. Because you could do that forever. Like at first, when Andy and I were failing, we were thinking, we were, I remember we were sitting in a restaurant and we were thinking, wow, like, once we're making a million dollars, we will like get a dog and go on vacation and like just play golf all the, all, the time, all the time. And then that happened and then we were working even harder. So it never ends. It never ends. And I, I have a lot of fun doing what I'm doing. It's really about the fun now. That's great. Um, so thank you for us, uh, answering my questions, Jessica. It was really insightful. Um, this is probably a good time um, to open the floor to um, all the startup grinders here who want to ask um, Jessica uh, a question. So we'll probably take around uh, three questions from the audience. Any first thing? Yes, Ms. Mark. Uh, yeah, um, looking back, with hindsight now, what would you do differently? <laughs> well, we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> Your top two. Uh, number one was probably uh, think more about like the real metrics that I cared about, not the vanity metrics. So the vanity metrics were like, user count, I'd say, was the biggest one. We were like growing our user count in a great way, but but the fundamental economics of the business weren't really looking too great. And I wish I paid a lot more attention to that. Um, and that's important because I was kind of deluding myself a lot. I was thinking, wow, we're really successful by that metric, but then how about all these other core health metrics? And, um, and then maybe another thing that I, I wish I had done differently is probably well, you just focus on the things that matter in the business more than press. Mm -hmm. like press really seemed to matter a lot to me. I thought, if only we just get more coverage, that'd be great. But, but you have to find customers at the end of the day. And press didn't necessarily mean more customers. We got a lot of articles and we like, tracked the results on the analytics. And I'm thinking, wow, we actually didn't get any customers out of this. That's just a waste of time. So. That's the second thing. Good question. Anyone else for the second question? Yes, sir. You said that <coughs> sorry. Um, you had a lot of press coverage. Did you use any services to really get that press coverage, or was it all just because word of mouth of the internet era? A lot of that press was organic. I actually had a friend I swapped press contacts with. Uh, I would get a lot of press just because I like met some reporters through like events, like meetups, like this. That's how I, I met you know, my, my first reporter contacts. And then through my combinator, I had a friend, uh, he runs a company called Hip Monk. They do uh, really hip travel search. Yeah. And he has a lot of press contacts too. So we swapped press contacts together and we were press buddies. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, like we didn't hire a PR firm or PR agency. I had a PR uh, freelancer to help me out a little bit. Um, but most of it was through myself. I didn't, I didn't delegate that away. Um, I think it was Paul. 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 Yeah. Um, Jeff, can you walk us through like the thought process, how you ended up here in the Philippines, and how would you, like, would you recommend the same process, give and take a few steps to fellow Y Combinator companies? Would it be good or bad for them to be actually here, knowing what you know now? Yeah, there aren't too many companies, uh, like Silicon Valley based companies, have enough in another office in another country. But for us, we were doing a lot of 
manual work. Like we weren't just a software company. We had accounting, we had tax stuff to do. And yeah, we're trying to automate all of that. But in the meanwhile, we still have all this work to get done. And we hired this lady, uh, she's living in Cebu. We hired her off some uh, online like freelancing website. And after that, we thought, wow, this lady's amazing. And she's in the Philippines. And you know Jose, and he's Filipino, so connect the dots. And let's, let's see if we can hire more people out here. And finding software engineers out here, and like we have a designer, we have a QA person on staff, so that, that full team is about 10 people now, um, 10 of the 30. And at first we didn't really know if we could hire any software people out here. Like I didn't know if there was a startup scene, I didn't know there was a startup grind, I didn't know about any of this. So we just said, let's just give it a try. Why not? We're going to be out in Manila anyway. Let's give it a try. And long and behold, there are some really smart people here. So I think a lot of it was just uh, coincidental, a lot of it was luck. We weren't really planning on opening up shop here, it just happened. And I think other companies in Silicon Valley could get a lot of value from opening up shop here. But it's really hard, because you have to have a local who understands what's going on. And, and then, even for me, like I'm trying to understand how you guys do business here in Manila. It takes a lot of time. You have to be really invested. You have to go all in, or don't go out at all. We went all in. Uh, yes? Uh, you mentioned Y Combinator, and I'm curious if, about you elaborating a little bit more on uh, the guidance that you got from either mentorship or peer groups, or like, you have a tough decision to make, how do you make that call? Sure. Uh, y Combinator is more for contacts. I need a lot of my press contacts and my investor contacts through Y Combinator. But for the actual like day-to-day -day business decisions and how I think about that, I, I, I'm part of a CEO group. Uh, you have there are so many CEO groups out there, but I'm part of one called the IPO, uh, Young Presidents Organization, and the people there are just phenomenal. Like they run companies that are doing like you know, they have, like the average company is doing 43 million in, in revenue a year, and that the median company has like 300, 400 employees. So these are big businesses, and we all share our, our ideas and our problems every month. We talk about not just work, but what are the personal problems we have in life? Because as a leader, a lot of the stuff you do at work is really connected to how you feel in your personal life, too. So you have to talk about the personal life and the family life before you get to the business problems. And I think it's good to have that group, that consistent group of people you talk to every month. And if you have mentors, mentors are good. But having peers who are going through the same problems you're going through right now, I think that helps a lot more in many cases. Sorry, follow-up question with that. So with, with um, YPO, you need a certain minimum to get in. So before YPO, would you suggest any other venues for getting that peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, yeah, you just make your own group. <laughs> uh, that's probably what, what I would do, but uh, I actually didn't have too many friends to talk to about my problems. I think one thing I didn't do very well was talk openly about it at the time. I was pretty, uh, pretty much just a hermit about it. I kept to my cave. I didn't want to talk about it because you go to events like this and you see the same people over and over again and they say, hey Jessica, how's it in there? And you have to like suck it up and say, yeah, things are doing great, even though you know everything's failing. Um, it's a really terrible feeling. So I stopped going to events, and I kind of locked myself up for a while. Uh, but then through Y Combinator, I have some friends uh, I could talk to about, about this stuff. And um, Andy, for example, my co-founder, he's trying to find other CTOs to talk to. So he's also going to, he's putting together his own group, and he has a few other friends he talks to on a regular monthly basis. So, you know, if the group doesn't exist, make your own. <laughs> okay, any other questions from the... That's yeah. it. Jessica, um, Silicon Valley is like the Hollywood for startups. Everyone, every startup wants to go there. Mostly, I guess, uh, technology startups. What's your, probably, um, what's your piece of advice for Filipino startups? Or gung-ho about raising funds or 
you know, going to Silicon Valley to set up their business there? Well, I think it's good to visit Silicon Valley and to get a feel for what it's like. And the culture out there is really interesting. But I don't think you have to be based out there. Like, I like it out there just because, you know, all my friends are there. I went to UC Berkeley for college and, and like, all my classmates stayed there. So I have, I have a reason to live there. But beyond that, I don't talk to the other Silicon Valley companies. I try to stay away from that because I'm worried about a lot of that culture. And a lot of that, there, there's a lot of bad stuff too. Like we hear about all the success, you read about it in the, in the newspapers, but we don't see it, the failures as much. And we don't see the downsides. We're insulated away from that. And I remember like being in the part of San Francisco where all the tech startups are, I would see all the startup t-shirts like everywhere. And I'm thinking, this is, these aren't real businesses. A lot of them aren't real businesses. So I moved my office to the financial district where everyone's wearing suits and ties. And, like, this is more like it. Uh, but if, again, like, just to answer your question more directly, if I didn't have like, friends or a reason to be in San Francisco, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there. I'm there for personal reasons, not for work reasons. Or more for personal than for work, and uh, and if you want to check out Silicon Valley, like let's talk afterwards about this some more. Uh, we'll probably take the last question from anyone there. Any last question? Yes. If you're approached by someone who's having doubts about starting a business, what can you say to your worker that is most well, if someone's having a doubt about it, like, you have to figure out like why why are they doubtful about it? Is it more that they question their ability, or is it because they don't have the funds? Like, what that's the reason? Because uh, a lot of the time, it's like it, it's pretty it's a pretty deep problem. Like, they actually want to start a business. It's just something that they're worried about. So for me. Um, the great thing about software companies is that we could still build a software company without having to like, quit our jobs, without having to uh, get funding for it. And that's what Andy and I did. We started building this while we were still in college, while we were still studying. So we could like dip our feet in, see how much we actually care to do it. And then we just realized, wow, this is actually a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, I'd say just give it a try. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. So, uh, Last question. Sure, sure. Pivoting back uh, to Indonero and the Philippines. So, do you see the Philippines organization growing for Indonero? Are you going to outsource more engineering work um, to the Philippines or more back office stuff? What is the future for you in the Philippines for Indonero? I think the future here is we're going to have a lot more of our development out here. I think right now it's pretty split. You have people doing like accounting work and tax work and payroll work, and then we have developers. But I think fast forward a year from now, we're gonna have 75 plus people in this office, and then two years from now, we're gonna be way past 100. And half of them are going to be developers, not just you know outsourced accounting workers, but real like product people. I think that's really exciting. I'm really excited to see that. And you guys have that here in Manila. That's, that's really awesome. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for um, being here.